We're going to look uh, this morning at uh, Philippians 1.1 1, 1, uh, down to verse 26. And so um, we want to uh, think together about the priority of the gospel as we uh, kick off this conference. And what a blessing it is to spend the day thinking about Philippians. Um, I'm very excited. I get to go first. Then I can just be part of the conference and listen for my own soul. Uh, listen to take notes as I think about my own church uh, and ministry. And so uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be here uh, today. I'll read uh, all of it. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice." Yes, I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And this is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for another opportunity we have to open your word, to study it together. We thank you for the message that we find here in the book of Philippians. I pray that you would uh, renew us in the gospel today. You would restore joy in our souls today. Give us renewed vision. Make us more like Christ as a result of being here. Fill us fresh with hope as we think about the good news that the tomb is empty. The throne is occupied. Life is worth living and to die is gain. Impress your truth on our hearts, we pray in Jesus' good name. And everyone said, amen, amen. In the book of Acts, you see that uh, the gospel is crossing great lines. Uh, it goes from Jerusalem and immediately into Samaria, and that was a big jump. That's not like, say, going from North Carolina to South Carolina. It was a massive cultural jump. And then you follow uh, along through the book of Acts and you see the gospel going to Turkey or modern day, or modern day Turkey, or then Asia Minor into Macedonia, Achaia, Ephesus, eventually to Rome, and it's headed toward the ends of the earth. And in the book of Acts, Luke emphasizes the unrelenting progress of the gospel in just a 30 year period of time. The gospel advances, not just into these different regions of the world, but also into different segments of society. We see the gospel confronting Roman law courts, Greek philosophers, rural Asian farmers, governmental officials, all sorts of people are being transformed by the gospel. And when Paul arrived in Philippi, the gospel crossed another great line, this time going into Europe. Um, our 
uh, elders every other year or so usually bring all of our missionaries to a particular place uh, in, in, in the world. And we've been going to Crete. Well, we've got to go somewhere. Uh, and so we've enjoyed uh, this all-inclusive place where we bring all of our missionaries in. And, and last year we decided to, to do a, a three-day stop on the way back home to uh, Thessaloniki in northern Greece. And uh, we were there with our wives. And one of those days we decided to drive to the ancient city of Philippi. It's about an hour and 45 minute drive. Absolutely beautiful drive if you ever uh, get to make that, uh, that, that trip. And there's a ton to see in Philippi. You can see the marketplace. You can see the river where Lydia was likely baptized. You can see the theater. And uh, we had rented this really cheap Volkswagen van called a Caddy. And it was, uh, you know, your basic van. It had no air conditioner vents in the back, uh, no speakers in the back. And uh, my executive pastor, Matt, who's older than me, was, was driving it. And it was, uh, we call him Maddie sometimes. So we, we called him Maddie the Caddy Daddy as he was driving us up through uh, northern Greece. And I was riding shotgun and I had uh, my Google Maps out. And I was just looking for stuff along the way, just trying to find uh, anything that would be of biblical significance. And I found an interesting site off the beaten trail outside of the ancient city of Philippi. Uh, it's the remains of uh, the old Roman road, the Via Ignatia. And Paul would have taken this road from the port of then Neapolis, now Kavala, uh, up to Philippi. I think the, the team may have a picture of this uh, road. And so you can see this road that goes down uh, to, the, to the port of, of Kavala or Neapolis. And Paul and his team um, would have made this trip of about 10 miles or so. And we got to stand on this uh, road just thinking about the significance of how the gospel was preached for the first time in Europe. The first church in Europe was planted. And although the, the geographical distinction uh, between the continents was not as prominent as it is uh, today, it was still an epic making event going from Asia Minor to Macedonia. And the gospel would eventually spread throughout Europe, and Europe would become a base for missionary outreach in the world. Now, when Paul got to Philippi, his time there wasn't as pleasant as our time with Maddie the Caddy Daddy. As he uh, went from Troas, as they meandered around trying to figure out what in the world they were going to do next, they went by boat across the Aegean uh, to Samothrace, and from there they arrived in Philippi. And he says in Thessal Thessal Thessalonians that they were shamefully treated in Philippi. And he says in chapter 1, at the end of our text in verse 30, into this chapter, you saw the conflict in which I was engaged. Yet despite the trials that Paul experienced in Philippi, Jesus displayed his power in the city, transforming lives and establishing a beachhead in Europe, establishing this congregation that Paul loved. He loved the Philippian church. Our church is currently uh, studying Corinthians in Southern Greece. He didn't so much love the Corinthian church. Uh, I mean, he did love them, but he, he didn't call the Corinthians what he calls the Philippians, which is my joy and my crown. I think he had some other things to say about the Corinthians. But he, but he loved this particular church that had been faithful to him, that had supported him from beginning to end. And there, there are not a lot of individuals that are named in Acts 16 when Paul is in Philippi who were converted. But we do get the story of three of them. And they're three radically different individuals. You have Lydia, who is an Asian, who's wealthy, a God-fearer, who comes to faith as Paul is opening up the Bible and God opens up the heart of Lydia to believe. What a, what a wonderful phrase, right? Like a flower opening to the sunlight. Her heart is open to the gospel and she believes. And then we read of a, a slave girl, as Luke calls her, a native Greek. She was poor. She was spiritually tormented. And God remarkably delivers and heals this uh, lady. And then there's a story of the blue collar jailer who's a Roman who witnesses this miracle as Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. The gospel breaks through in uh, each of their lives. Others are added to the faith. And now as we come to Philippians, some 10 years later, Paul writes a letter to this church. He can't visit them because he's in prison. And he writes to them to keep focusing on the gospel. He thanks them for their partnership. He models Christian joy to them. He reminds them of many of the basics of the faith. And he addresses this fundamental need to be unified in Christ. 
Now, in here in chapter one, what I want us to, to think about is how Paul puts the focus on the gospel. You see the gospel mentioned in uh, verse five, partners in the gospel. You see it mentioned again in verse 12, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Uh, verse 16, uh, as he talks about um, being put there in defense of the gospel and not in my text, but twice in verse 27, he speaks about uh, living worthy of the gospel. Uh, it's throughout this letter, chapter two, verse 22, as he's talking about the ministry of Timothy that he had served with Paul in the gospel. Uh, later in chapter four, verse three, he mentions those who had labored side by side with him in the gospel. And then finally in chapter four, verse 15, uh, that the Philippians, he says, you know, uh, that in the beginning of the gospel, that is his ministry, uh, that they had uh, participated and supported him. So in sh this short little book, the gospel, the, the, the term appears, uh, throughout and the term Christ, who is the center of the gospel appears some 50 times, not to mention the pronouns that refer to him. So the gospel of Jesus Christ dominates the letter to the Philippians. As one scholar has said, it takes first place in Paul's mission and in his letter. Or as Gordon Fee says, it does not take much reading of Paul's letters to recognize that the gospel is the singular passion in his life. That passion is the glue that in particular holds this letter together. So we're talking about the priority of the gospel. This word gospel means good news. Euangelion. It was used in uh, cases like when the Greeks would go off to battle, let's say against the Persians, everyone back in the city states would wonder about the outcome and the Greeks would send back a messenger as the people wondered, will we, did we win? Will we be enslaved? And that messenger, if he had good news, would say, we, we've conquered, we're not slaves, we have triumphed. That was a new angelion, that was good news. And the gospel brings us even greater news, that someone has triumphed on our behalf. Our greatest problem is already solved. And we are to build our lives around this great glorious truth and proclaim it to the world that needs to hear it. And so let's think about the priority of the gospel in these opening verses, which are very warm and very affectionate, very passionate. And you see the things that make, makes Paul really tick, what stirs his heart. And I want you to see just two things from our text. First of all, he values his partners in the gospel. And secondly, he prioritizes the advancement of the gospel. Now, it's very easy to care about the wrong things in ministry. These are two things I think we should care about. We care about our partners in the gospel, and we want to advance the gospel. So let's look at uh, this section together. Uh, the, the letter opens uh, in, uh, as, as Paul uh, refers to himself with Timothy as servants of Christ Jesus or slaves of Christ Jesus. It's a great privilege to be a servant of Christ Jesus. I love the book of Common Prayer where it says Christians are bound to Christ in whose service is perfect freedom. Isn't that beautiful? To all the saints, the set apart ones in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers, those who have pastoral duties and the deacons, those who are assisting the overseers, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins with this thanksgiving and prayer. And I want you to see four ways in which Paul expresses his love for his partners in the gospel. First of all, he thanks God for them. Verse three to five, as he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. He's regularly moved by his remembrance of the Philippians. Even though he is in prison, his heart is still free. His heart is still brimming with thanksgiving. And he assures them of his frequent joyous prayers for them. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now, when you read Paul's letters, many of you are aware of this, when, when Paul would write a thanksgiving and opening prayer, he's, he's doing more than just giving thanks and praying. He's also going to touch on some themes that he will elaborate later on in the letter. And I think that's the case here as he touches on what will be a major topic in the book of Philippians, namely joy. As he's making his prayer with joy, joy will be all over the letter to the Philippians which is remarkable given the fact that the guy who is in prison is talking about joy. <laughs> He's telling the people not in jail to rejoice. Do you find that challenging? I do. Do you think you just need something else 
to have real joy. Better behaved kids, a better job, a different address. His joy is bound up with Christ and not his circumstances. His joy is tied up with his relationship to this church. They brought him joy. And this is where we, have, where we find joy, in the gospel and in the community of the gospel. He gives his reason for this joyful thanksgiving when he says, because of your partnership, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, we talk about fellowship in the church as, you know, hot drinks after church or uh, in the South, uh, fried chicken or something along those lines. Uh, but, but this word conveyed a whole lot more than that kind of thing. It was a, a word that, that carried commercial overtones, like you were business partners. There, there was a common mission that made you a fellowship, not just a friendship, but there was a, a commonality that brought you together. And that's what uh, uh, Paul and the Philippians were. They were partners in this gospel mission. They desired to make Christ known. The Philippians had supported Paul financially, which is a, a very practical element of being a true partner in the gospel. Their skin in the game to, to uh, qualify you as such. And so Paul gives thanks to the Philippians because they were really partners in this common mission. Now, the second thing that Paul does in verse six is he gives his partners in the gospel reassurance about the work of God in their life. When he says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. How many of you are glad that's true? <laughs> God had begun the saving work. You can read about that in Acts 16. And this is not only God's work, but it's God's good work. He who began this good work in you will bring it to completion. It is a good work because it flows from the very goodness of God. Paul shares his own testimony over in chapter three, doesn't he? As he's relating upon his former life and how Jesus transformed him. As he says in verse six of chapter three, uh, he used to be a persecutor of the church and now he's writing a letter to the church. How do you go from persecuting the church to being a partner with the church or planting a church? Many of you have this story in this room. God began a good work in you. He's continuing his work in you. For many years, I went over to Ukraine to teach uh, church planters. I would go about a week uh, every year. And I remember on one occasion, we were going around the room just uh, getting to know one another. And this brother from Lithuania named Emmanuel, who's about, I don't know, six, seven or eight, massive guy, had uh, all these prison tattoos from his time formerly in prison. And he's introducing himself. And he said the only time he used to uh, open the Bible was to tear pages out of the Bible and to put something in those pages and smoke it. And, and now he's in a church planting class, uh, right? Like, how do you go from smoking the Bible to preaching the Bible? <laughs> God began a good work in him. And Jesus changes lives. Paul reminds the church of that. He reassures them of God's good work in them. Paul's going to give them some strong exhortations, but notice pastorally what he does first is he, he gives them this foundation of grace so that they're prepared to hear the exhortations that follow. God is at work in you. He'll, he'll uh, deal more with that in chapter 2, 12, and 13 as he's talking about uh, God bringing all of this work about by his pleasure. And he's going to complete this work, verse 6, until the day of Christ Jesus, when Christ subdues all opposition, consummates the kingdom, judges the world, and brings about a new creation. This is on Paul's mind all the time. Verse 10, he, he talks about the day of Christ. God started this work, God continues this work, God will complete this work. Sometimes when students fail to turn in assignments, they get an incomplete. Perhaps you've had some incompletes before. Or maybe you've had some incomplete projects around your house before. God has no incompletes. He always completes what he starts. As Paul writes to the uh, Corinthians, he will sustain you to the end. So it's good to encourage brothers and sisters of this great assurance that we have. Remind your partners of the gospel, uh, partners in the gospel of God's, God's good work of grace in them. And then thirdly, he expresses this affection for them. Verses seven to eight, it's a Christ-centered affection, isn't it? As he begins to think about the Philippian church, he says, it's right for me to hold you in my heart, to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. Paul's not just a, a brain on a stick. This is a guy who has a big heart for people. 
And he has this affection because it is rooted in his relationship with Jesus. Notice it is the affection of Christ Jesus. I take that to mean his affection is not just due to his personality. It's due to his Christology. His affection for the Philippians is an overflow of his devotion to Jesus. And many of you know this word affection refers to the inward parts being moved to the point of one's bowels, or as we say, the pit of the stomach. It is a deep affection that he has. It is a heart beating with the heart of Christ. And he says, God can attest to it. Now, for many of us, if we're honest, there are many days that such affection doesn't come so easily. As we, we live in a very project-oriented world, and people can sort of, you know, get in the way of our task. <laughs> and Paul gives us a wonderful pattern here of being others-focused, having deep affection, and we would do well to dwell regularly on the affection that Jesus has poured out on us in order to melt our hearts and make us more gentle and warm and loving to those that we're serving. Well, the fourth thing that he does is he prays for his partners in the gospel. Verses nine to 11. Don't you love the prayers of Paul? They're so instructive and inspiring as we think about our own prayer life. We all need help with prayer, I think we, we could say. For some people, they need help with the discipline of prayer. I remember when I was in seminary, we read books by guys like E.M. Bounds, who wrote these books on prayer. And I remember being a young seminary student, asking my seminary prof, you know, as we were reading about guys getting up at four in the morning to pray, I just had a question. I was like, you know, did, did they just go to bed early because they had no electricity? Like, because uh, I, 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 I can get up that early if I go to bed at six. Um, and and I, I remember somebody asking the professor at the time, um, yeah, what, can you tell us about your life? Like, what are your patterns and so on? And he didn't say this to boast. He was very sheepish about it, actually. But he said, guys, I've been getting up at 430 in the morning for the last 15 years of my life in order to have, and these were two words he used a lot, unhurried and unhindered time with God. And he said, I, um, I started doing that when I, start, when I had kids. I do it out of necessity, not because I like mornings. But if I'm gonna have unhurried and unhindered time, that's what I have to do. And I was thinking to myself, is God up at 4.30? Like, uh, <laughs> like, I got up at 7.54 for this eight o'clock class and I prayer walked over here. Uh, d does, that, does that count? <laughs> Now, I don't mean that everybody needs to kind of adopt that method, but that was, a, that was, that was help for the discipline of prayer. But, but some of you may not have need for that kind of discipline, but the content of prayer, what do you pray for? And this is where I find Paul's prayers to be instructive. Because you might have a prayer list, and I don't know if you're praying through your list, and at times you get to the people and you're kind of like, uh, I, I kind of run out of things to say. And, and it's like, well, this is Tuesday's group, and Lord, just bless Tuesday's lot really well, you know. <laughs> and here's an idea, you can pray with Paul. Take the prayers of the Apostle Paul and pray them for people. D.A. Carson has a whole book on that, Expositions of Paul's Prayers. And one of the things you find in Paul's prayers is that his prayers focus on the spiritual growth of people. You don't, you don't find Paul praying for things. You pray, see Paul praying for people. It's, it's fine to pray about things. You can pray for healing. We can cast all of our cares upon our God because he cares for us. That is totally true. But the focus of Paul's prayers is, is, his, is spiritual growth and the vitality of the people. Keller says, it is remarkable that in all of his writings, Paul's prayers for his friends contain no appeals for change in their circumstances. What he prays for regularly is that they would be transformed more into the image of Jesus. He wants them to change. He wants them to grow. You know, if you meet someone you haven't seen in 15 years and they look to you and they say, man, you haven't changed a bit. That's a compliment. Or they're lying or one of the two, right? But if someone were to look at your spiritual life and say, you haven't changed a bit, that's a problem. And Paul here gives us some things to pray for. And the focus of this prayer is, is really this growth in love. Notice the basic petition in verse nine, as he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. I think the love is for one another, given the context of the whole letter and the need for unity, that their, their love would abound more and more for one another 
and that this love needs to be rooted in knowledge and wisdom. It's not a blind enthusiasm, but a love that is in, within the sphere of knowledge. In our day, people want to separate knowledge of God's word from love. As we hear, love is love. No, love is to be guided by a sensitivity to the truth of God. And he says that this love should abound in the sphere of every kind of discernment. So knowledge asks the question, what is right? That's to govern our love. And then discernment asks the question, what is best? So he's praying for a kind of love that will have a sensitivity to the truth of God and a sensitivity to the needs of others in a particular situation. What is the best way for me to love this person based on what your word says? The relationships are very complex and God hasn't just uploaded a program into our brains, but rather he's given us his truth and by a spirit, we want to use discernment in thinking about how to best love one another. And then he gives the purposes of that petition in verse 10 and 11, when he says, so that you may approve what is excellent. If he still has relationships in mind, he's talking about uh, the choosing the things that are best in this life and in their relationships. To be pure and blameless, this, this moral purity, again, probably tied to the sphere of relationships, being pure in regard to, to killing sins of envy and pride and selfish ambition, complaining, arguing, which you see pop up in the letter, for the day of Christ Jesus. The day of Christ Jesus in the future is to change how we live in the present. That day is to always be on our mind. As Luther used to say, there are two days on my calendar, this day and that day. I live this day in light of that day. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness. It is the righteous fruit that is present in right relationships that comes through Jesus Christ which is the good news. We aren't left to our own power for purity and righteousness. It comes through Jesus Christ. And right up front by highlighting the source of power for spiritual growth in this opening section, the Philippians can now hear the exhortations that will come later with hope. They aren't powerless and neither are we. To the glory and praise of God. The grand reason for all things, which appears in 2.11 in the great Christ hymn to the glory of God the Father. And then at the end of the letter in chapter 4, verse 20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's very striking how much Paul prays in his letters. And it's a good reminder for us that prayer is essential to the Christian life, to Christian ministry, to Christian leadership. I know we overuse the word essentials in modern society like oils that are <laughs> essential as if we cannot live without them. Uh, helpful oils, nice oils. I appreciate the oils. Uh, but when we say prayer is essential, it, it like it is. And when you, when you read Acts, you see a church that had very little resources, but they prayed and they turned the world upside down. And what was essential for the early church has sadly become supplemental for the contemporary church. Let's pray for the spiritual growth of our gospel partners. That's how Paul values his partners in the gospel. Secondly, notice how Paul prioritizes the advancement of the gospel. Uh, you notice in verse 12, he uses the word progress or advance. And then he uses it again in verse 25 to talk about the Philippians progress and joy in the faith. So kind of bookending this section where the first usage is about the progress of the gospel in Rome. We, we could call that evangelistic progress. And then the second usage is about the Philippian congregation's spiritual progress. So we can think in, in terms of, of those categories as we work our way through this text. Evangelistic progress, let that be central in our aspirations. And then spiritual progress, let that be central as we pastor and lead and shepherd. So. Paul goes about it uh, in verse 12 by saying, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He can be very positive in this report because the gospel is spreading and that's what Paul really treasures. What he doesn't say is, man, this has been so hard. I miss so many things. Can someone bring me uh, special roasted coffee? 
He is consumed with the gospel. And it's advancing through imprisonment. Isn't that remarkable? You can see the providence of God here. Paul wants to go to Spain and God allowed him to be locked up. And yet it was through the imprisonment that the sovereign Lord was making his gospel known in Rome. We never know how God might use suffering or unplanned circumstances to advance the gospel. And here he says, here are two ways in which the gospel uh, is advancing. First, people are hearing the gospel. Secondly, others are now more bold in speaking the gospel. Verses 12 and 13, people are hearing. He says, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So Paul has a captive audience. And the message is making an impact on this imperial guard. As Paul lived and taught, the Romans no doubt were discussing what had brought him there and what he was talking about. Think about that for a moment. This is just very practical and encouraging. Imprisonment didn't prevent Paul from evangelism or commending Christ. It couldn't. You remember when he was in prison that Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. It's a reminder to us that we talk about that which we love, regardless of our situation. You meet a new, newly engaged lady and you say, hey, tell me about your fiance. And off she goes, showing you the picture. You get in a debate about which state has the best barbecue or why MJ is better than LeBron. <laughs> or God forbid you talk to someone about pickleball. I was like, can we... Can we just dial it back a little bit on pickleball? Um, <laughs> people are always evangelizing. They're always talking about something. And I don't think Paul is doing this work unless he is first treasuring Christ himself. His circumstances would have crushed him. All his plans have been rearranged. What happens when your plans get rearranged? Are you thinking about evangelism? All his aspiration to, to, to preach where Christ had not been named. And yet he's stuck in a prison. And he's still talking about Christ. It's so, so challenging. And then he says, because of this also, others are speaking. They're more confident in the Lord. They are inspired by my imprisonment. Carson points out how uh, this is similar to Jim Elliott when his four missionary friends were brutally killed by the Indians that a high number of Wheaton College graduates soon offered themselves as missionaries in the years following. Christians were becoming more confident, more bold, speaking fearlessly. So my friends, let's keep the advancement of the gospel central in our aspirations. Let that matter more than a uh, job or money or comfort let us be asking the question, what will advance the gospel the most? Let's be asking this question in our churches. How easy is it to, to be consumed with comforts rather than gospel advancement? With things that are just not primary. And when it is advancing, let's rejoice. So he rejoices at that, how it is spreading. And then he rejoices that it is being preached even by his critics. This is a very interesting passage, isn't it? In verses 15 to 18, where some are preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry. You see in the first century, there used to be some envy and rivalry in ministry. But others are doing it out of goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing I'm put here in defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. And don't you love Paul's reaction to all of it? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached and I rejoice. So you have this one group, we'll call them the envious evangelists. This other group, we'll call them the empathetic evangelists. The first view Paul's imprisonment as an occasion to tear him down, to stir up trouble, and to try to elevate their own ministry above the apostle Paul's. They've grown jealous that he has an elevated reputation. And then you have this other group that really care about Paul. They know that he is there by God's sovereign will, not as a result of disobedience or unfaithfulness, and they're serving out of goodwill. And Paul concludes, through it all, Christ is preaching, I rejoice. 
Now, he would not rejoice if a false, false gospel would have been proclaimed, right? Just see Galatians. But because, apparently, this was the gospel that was being preached, even from wrong motives, not that Paul would condone the wrong motives, but his priority is that Christ is preached. And in that, he says, I rejoice. There's so many practical takeaways uh, from this. One is quite simply to, let's be aware of jealousy and envy in the ministry. Let's not constantly be comparing ourselves with others. Let's rejoice when our friends succeed. Let's not resent it when others are elevated. You see, Satan often won't tempt you with the love of money or with sexual sin. He may try envy, rivalry. And what I've learned, I'm sure you've noticed this, that the more proximity you have to a person, the more you'll be tempted by envy and jealousy. I'm less likely to be jealous of a, like a college student who's much younger than me or someone who's in a different field, like an astronaut or a great pumpkin farmer. <laughs> yeah, I pray you succeed, man. It's, <laughs> I'm tempted to be jealous of other pastors, other writers, other speakers. How do you crush envy? I think if we learn from Paul here, it's this. You care more about Jesus's glory than your own. He doesn't care about being adored. He cares about Jesus being proclaimed. May God that work, work that into our hearts. And if others envy you on the flip side, let's follow Paul's example. He doesn't get wrapped up in all of it. He just says Christ has preached. Let's keep the focus there. So he is rejoicing that the gospel is advancing through Rome. And then finally, notice that he, his, his concern is for the spiritual progress of the Philippians. As we enter into this sort of uh, dialogue that Paul has with himself about living or dying, he says, yes, I will continue to rejoice. And he talks about this, this dilemma that he has by first referencing the Philippians' prayers for him and that he knows this is going to turn out for his deliverance. Scholars have pointed out he's probably taken a phrase here from Job uh, 13. 16, this shall turn out for my salvation or my deliverance. Possibly through believing in a, in a present deliverance from his present situation, but more, I think, eschatologically that this will turn out, he will be vindicated regardless of what is going to, what's going to happen on earth in this particular situation. He's trusting in God. He knows this will turn out for his deliverance, but notice how it's the prayers of the church that are building him up. Through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And this leads him into this thought about life and death. That his whole goal, he says in verse 20, is that Christ would be honored, whether by life or by death. And then he engages in a, a, uh, this dialogue about living or dying with the option of remaining alive and building up the Philippians. For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. What a, what a crystal clear verse about our lives. I'm sure many of you love that verse. We have one life. And this is the outlook, I think, that made Paul so unstoppable and so aggravating to his opponents. <laughs> what are they going to do to him? Hey, Paul, we, we don't like you and your Messiah. We're going to kill you. Oh, that'd be great. To die is gain. <laughs> Guards come back. Well, on second thought, we're going to allow you to live. Oh, fantastic. That means fruitful, joyous labor. <laughs> Guards, well, we're going to let you live, but we're going to make you suffer. For I consider the sufferings of this present world not worth comparing next to the glory that will be revealed to us. You kill me, I'll be with Christ. You let me live, I live for Christ. You make me suffer, I get a reward from Christ. What you got? What a, what a vision of life. Life is about Jesus. Death is about experiencing more of Jesus. He's torn between the options. Verse 22, we have this dilemma. It's a win-win, isn't it? It's like asking, do you want a filet or a ribeye? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimate preference, verse 23, my desire is to depart. Hmm. That was a nautical term to describe a, a ship letting loose from its mooring 
or hoisting its anchor. Death is like that. You go out on a boat and you see the lights get more and more dim. If you're on a, on a cruise ship, they go out and you wake up in the Caribbean. Paul says, I, de- I desire to depart and to wake up and see Jesus Christ. That's his preference, but he makes a noble decision, doesn't he? Verses, uh, the, the final verse there in 24 and 6. But to remain is more necessary on your account. He knows that the Philippians are an unfinished task. And this is why he'll stay on planet earth. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. What a clarifying goal for ministry to see people's progress and joy in the faith. That sounds a lot like uh, 2 Corinthians 1, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in the faith. There are thousands of things we could do for someone, but here is a crystal clear aim. We work with you for your joy, for your progress and joy in the faith. What do you wanna see in others, in your kids, in your small group, in your church, isn't it that they would abound with joy in Christ, to be satisfied in Christ, to glory in Christ. Every sermon, every small group, every student ministry function, every Zoom meeting, every family devotion, every conversation, all of it for their gladness in God. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. In other words, as a result of Paul surviving, Lord willing, uh, seeing them again, a celebration of Christ would happen. They would glorify Jesus when Paul was present with them. And let us long to see believers make spiritual progress and have increased measure of joy in Christ. So as we look over this opening section, these first 26 verses, we see how Paul prioritizes the gospel. He values his partners in the gospel. He prioritizes the advancement of the gospel. It is easy for us to care about the wrong things in ministry. Let's keep the gospel first. Who knows what Paul envisioned when his team landed in Philippi and started walking up that road from Neapolis to Philippi. But when he got there, the sovereign Lord used him mightily. Converts were made. The first church in Europe was established. A partnership was formed. And listen, who knows what road the sovereign Lord may lead you down? Whatever road he takes you on, let's make sure we prioritize the good news of Jesus Christ. And may we be able to say in every station of life to live as Christ and to die as gain. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for all that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray you would strip away from our hearts all the idols that that compete with our treasuring of Christ. May we learn from the apostle Paul who matters most. Give us this great vision of life and this great uh, glorious vision of death. And I pray that as we ponder all that is ours in Jesus Christ, we could live, uh, Lord, with a, a sense of freedom and liberty, um, that you would give us an, uh, an others-focused ministry, uh, that we would uh, follow after the, the pattern of the Apostle Paul in valuing his partners in the gospel. Uh, may we learn from the way he uh, communicates to them, reassures them of grace, and even prays for them. I pray uh, even today, uh, Lord, you would put people in our minds who are our partners in the gospel that we may say a good word to, give thanks to, may pray for, and give us this gospel aspiration of wanting to see uh, the kingdom advance uh, to the ends of the earth. May we prioritize that over our own comforts, over our own desires, even our own plans. And I pray that when our plans get um, changed, uh, that we would not be those who are complaining and murmuring but actually looking for ways to advance the gospel, even in the midst of some unchanged circumstance. Uh, help us to see that you're providential, uh, providentially guiding our steps and sovereign over it all. And we give you glory and praise. And we pray this in Christ's good name. Amen.